before we continue, you were talking about activation functions. How, uh, what was their effect on the back propagation algorithm? We, we talked about sigmoid and 10H, and what, we, what, what was the disadvantage, what was the main disadvantage of them for um, training? And you were just about to talk about real. So you can see the graph. It's quite simple because just looking at the graph, you'll give you an idea about the derivatives as well. If the input to the function is negative, uh, the output is zero. And for that region where the input is negative, the gradient is also zero. This is a problem, just like I said, because it kills the gradients. However, when the output is positive, the output is passed as it is, so it's a linear function there. And the gradient is one. And remember how the back propagation worked. It worked in a, uh, with the chain rule, derivative chain rule. So it was multiplied. It is like if the input to that layer is positive, pass the gradient of the loss as it is, multiply it by one. That's the mechanism of it. So it is like, it's like an on-off switch for the gradient, if you can think about it, because it's an on-off switch. And when you draw the gradients of it, it makes more sense. So the gradients of this function is I'm drawing the gradient of that blue function over it is. It is like this. So this is where it is off, it is where it's on. So during back propagation, it is like an on-off switch for the gradient flow. If the input to that layer is positive, the gradient switch is on, so it let it pass the gradient. It lets it lets the gradient pass. If the input to that layer is negative, it just kills the gradient. So it is like you have a you have an arm, uh, uh, neuromotor uh, connections to control your arm. You're using some of the connections, and you're not using some of the connection uh, connections to make a sample movements, a simple movements, or you you make an action. That's how it exactly works. That's why it's called neural networks. Good. So we know what it is now. Uh, and in the positive region, it does not saturate. That's why we have the gradients there. And more importantly, it's very, very computationally efficient. I mean, the gradient and the forward function are not, do not need any computations. They are just if analysis. If negative, zero. If positive, pass. And the gradient is in negative, zero. If positive one. And we come to a problem known as the dying ReLU problem. What is the dying ReLU problem? I think you already know this. Imagine that I'm going to draw the same thing. So we have a layer. In this layer, I have an x coming in. So what I'm calculating is omega times x b if it's a fully connected layer. And if the function is ReLU, I'm calculating this function and it's the output. So let's say the output is y, the y. During back propagation, what happens is I'm going to go over it once again because this is important loss with respect to y. So loss with respect to x. So what I need is loss. So let me write it here. No, let me write it here. I don't have space there. Loss with respect to y times x. So the derivative of y, this function, with respect to x. If I take the derivative of this function with respect to x, because this is y, right? I'm trying to calculate this. If I take the derivative, it is something like, sorry, derivative of f with these values inside times omega. The value of the omega could be anything, positive, negative, doesn't matter. But the value of this function is depending on the value of activation, because that's the summation here. It could be anything. If this is negative, sorry, it's, if this is negative, if this value is negative, if this is negative, the derivative of the real function is zero. In this case, this layer will not allow 
anything backwards. I mean, this was a problem we encountered in 10H and sigmoid for the saturated regions, which is like infinite. The unsaturated regions are very limited. This is where we have it for negative values. So, because value output zero for every negative value, a ReLU neuron might get stuck dead, not being able to feed any uh, gradient in backwards fashion in the negative side and always output zero and it's unlikely for it to recover. Because the thing is, why it is unlikely to recover? Think of the great, think of the training. You're feeding something back, okay? If that uh, ReLU is dead, there won't be any gradients uh, flowing in backwards. If there are no gradients flowing, uh, flowing in backwards graph, the weights will not change. And if the weights do not change, the input that well is in the training set will be creating always negatives. And it's a point where the ReLU gets stuck. If this happens, the gradient flowing through the unit will forever be zero from that point on. That is, the ReLU units can irreversibly die during training since they cannot get knocked off out of data manifold. This is called the dying ReLU problem, guys. And actually, when you're training a simple convolution neural network, this happens a lot. Some studies show that almost 40% of the ReLU gets dead during training. So it is like you're training your hand for a specific purpose, and it's made of ReLUs, for example. You don't use some of the neurons because you don't have to. In your life, you don't have to make some specific movements. You only do the things that you do in your life. And as you get older and older, because of the things that you do not do, you don't use much of your neurons and they die. They are, they are useless. And actually this happens. Like a study shows, just like I said, 40% of the ReLUs get that during training. This is the dying ReLU problem. How to solve this? Versions of ReLU. Just like your friend says, different versions of 10H can solve that problem. Different versions of leaky ReLU can, uh, ReLU can solve that problem. So this is the leaky ReLU. It's like there's a leakage here. It's leaking. Which makes the derivative non-zero, as you can see. So it is like it's this value, not zero. So it does not saturate in positive region, very computation. It, 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 it saturates, sorry, this is not leaky ReLU. Leaky ReLU saturates in positive region. This is wrong, sorry, wrong. I have to correct it in my slides. The important thing is the gradients don't die the negative part. So if you do not want to experience the dying ReLU problem, you use what is called the leaky ReLU. Good. Now, uh, I think enough for uh, activation functions, enough, enough for the gradients, enough for the training. I think you now are ready to implement your training algorithm in your code and even to check it when you start the training and it's not training. Well, you can check many things. Debug your code and during the backward pass, check if your ReLU is dead. You can easily check it. You can easily check it because you are just updating the gradients and gradients are transparent in PyTorch at least. Because in MATLAB, they are not transparent. That's why that's the framework academic people use. So just check it. There are many tools you know and you can use to make everything better. Remember in the previous week when we were talking about the input layer, we talked about preprocessing. The input layer was for preprocessing. I'm going to just delve into it again, then I'm going to jump into weight initialization, which is related to this stuff. Remember, we did normalization. We made the data zero input. The reason we do it is the same reason we had that problem with sigmoid. I said sigmoid output was not zero centered. And this was a problem when we were trying to optimize it. We didn't get into the details of it, but what I said was optimization was affected and was slowed down. And when optimization is slowed down, optimization sometimes can also get that. For the same reason we have that in sigmoids, we have the same problem with most of the type of inputs. For example, 
image pixels. Image pixels are always positive. So the first layer you feed into will be positive values. That's why to make the optimization process more, uh, I mean, convenient uh, or more trainable, we usually apply a sort of pre-processing to our data at the input layer or beforehand. We prepare a training set such. And if the original data is like that, we make it zero set that we find the mean of the data and subtract it. Or sometimes we divide the, each dimension with the standard deviation, which will normalize the data. But still we have this correlation in this data. You can do further operations like you can uh, use the covariance matrix to whiten the data. In that case, you'll be carrying your data to a new dimensional space where each dimension is independent, orthogonal to each other. Uh, this, this will make uh, your problem simpler to optimize again, because when you're op trying to optimize, this is, this, is the way, uh, this is the input space. If the input space is whitened, decorrelated, this will help you train it better. And there are different methods for it. One of them is called the principal component analysis to do it. Sometimes we apply it to the input so that it will be better trained. Principal component analysis is something we, not go, we are not going to delve into in this course, but I strongly recommend you learn it if you're serious with machine learning guys, because it's something fundamental. I mean, statistics guys, you all already know it. I mean, electrical engineering guys, you already know this. I mean, most probably computer engineering guys, you, also, you already know that too. For those who haven't come across PCA, the principal component analysis, I strongly recommend. I mean, this is, it is beyond the scope of this course, but it's quite related to machine learning and deep learning. So, as you can see, uh, we have a graph which we initialize the weights, uh, we, we, which we learn the weights, update the weights so that we learn. At this point, what is the first value of weights? Because we are doing an iterative optimization function, the gradient descent or a, or a variant of it, where we change the weights iteratively. How to do it? How to find the first weights? It is called weight initialization. And it's a serious business, guys. Historically, it, people were initializing with small random numbers so that it doesn't get exploded or what. However, in the last decade, there have been some important studies of weight initialization, and there are some rules of thumbs to use. We are going to talk about them. Um, they are more like some tailored heuristics. Some scientists in the field tailored those heuristics, rules of thumbs for us so that we could effectively train our neural networks, okay? Uh, for stochastic gradient descent, basically, because that's how we train our supervised deep neural networks. So this is from deep learning. This is the only textbook that I've provided, remember, Goodfellows Deep Learning. And what it says is, training deep models is sufficiently difficult task, and the initial point to determine is actually quite crucial. The initial point to determine is actually where the blind guy starts walking. You can see that, right? Because the blind guy trying to find its way is you trying to find the weights in the algorithm. So the starting point of the blind guy is very important. I mean, the place, if you're, the place, if you're near the place you're trying to go, the blind guy, you will easily find it. But if you're in a, some place where it's just so different and there are some ways that you cannot find it's like a labyrinth, I don't know. We don't know the shape of the uh, gradient uh, weight space. It's usually quite complicated. You won't be able to find, the blind guy won't be able to find its way. So it is best that you start from a good place. So each time a neural network is initialized with a different set of weights, uh, it will start a different starting point. It will uh, initiate a different starting point for the optimization process and will potentially lead the blind guy finding its way to a different place maybe, to a different local minima, because the blind guy in the end just feels at some point, feels the gradients, the slope, and finds a place that it can stop. How to initialize them? We can, well, 
the first idea that comes to mind is initializing them to zero. This is not a good idea. Why? Well, heuristically, it will be putting the blind guy to the origin. And origin is not necessarily a good place to sit because depending on your computational graph, the origin will create values where the activation function is close to zero. Remember all activation functions, the inputs are zero, right? So if your weight is zero, if your bias is zero, whatever the input is, the output of the activation function is zero. And for many um, activation functions, including ReLU, that point is a singular value. You cannot take the derivative of. So it is like the blind guy just trying to decide where to go with its first step, but it cannot feel the slope properly because the derivative of ReLU at the origin at zero is uh, undefined. So it's not a good idea. What is a good idea then? It's a very, very open field, guys. And there are two important approaches. The first one is the Xavier initialization found, found by uh, two guys called uh, Gloroth and Xavier, uh, Xavier Gloroth and uh, Yoshio Bengio. These are famous guys. This was an algorithm to initialize the 10H. Very important not real 10H, how to initialize 10H, an analysis on how to initialize NH. And the paper is called Understanding the Difficulty of Training Deep Forward Neural Networks. If you check, if you're interested in the mathematics of it, check it. It is called, because of the first author's name, uh, Xavier Gloroth, it's either called Xavier initialization, in some libraries it's called Gloroth initialization, doesn't matter. What it does is, it just creates a random distribution for the weights, a uniform distribution for the weights, where that uniform distribution is bounded between these two values, where n is the input to that layer. So if you have, if it's a fully connected layer with 100 inputs, so it is between minus 0 0.1 to plus 0 0.1, uniformly distributed. Why? They mathematically prove that this helps the training of 10H. Uh, and there's a normalized version as well. So there, there are different versions of normalized Xavier or Xavier. When you're initializing a layer with that activation function, for example, you have a layer with fully connected layer and you have a, because you remember the weight multiplication layers needed an activation layer for non-narity. Depending on the nonlinear uh, activation function, we decide the initialization uh, strategy for that weight multiplication layer. And if the activation function is 10H, we usually use Xavier or normalized Xavier, where uh, the, in, we don't, you don't use the input value to that layer, you use the input value to that layer and the output value of that layer as well, because J plus one is the input to the next layer. So, you both uh, uh, take the inputs, number of inputs, and the number of outputs of that layer into account and calculating for the normalized Xavier version. Why? We are not getting into the details of it, okay? What you should know is Xavier initialization works well with 10H and sigmoid. It was found to have problems when used to initialize networks that use ReLU, because that's why we have another initialization for ReLU, which we are going to see in the following slides. Modified versions of this approach was developed specifically for nodes and layers that really activation. However, it is not the Xavier that we use in ReLU. So what is that we use in ReLU? It's called the Hay initialization. By the way, this Xavier is in 2014 paper, 2010 paper. Hay initialization is 2015. So studying the initializations of these weight multiplication layers according to the activation functions it's pretty much new if you look at the history of deep learning because the history of deep learning dates back to like 70s, 60s when people first working on the uh, back propagation on computational graphs such as artificial neural networks. So these are new subjects. Hayinchization is, which was found by Kai Ming He, guy from, he was in China by then, he's in, with Facebook right now. He's a famous guy in the field. Um, 
he is the guy who found the residual networks. So in Hay initialization, which is specifically designed for ReLU, um, we have a different type of uh, initialization where we use a Gaussian distribution and normal distribution. You find random values to the weights where the distribution is Gaussian, it's zero-centered, and the variance is, or the standard deviation is, square root of two over the number of inputs. And the variance makes the square of it. So I don't have to tell you this. That's how you initialize it. And in his paper, he proves that this is a better way to initialize value. So a good starting point will be for you at this level is to initialize your weights with Xavier if the activation function is sigmoid or 10H, or with Kymin Cajun station if you're using um, ReLU as the activation function for that plate multiplication layer, whether convolutional or I don't know, fully connected. How are you going to do this? Well, you can implement these functions. They are very simple functions, but you don't have to. All the frameworks already have this initialization method. So when you're creating a, a layer like this, I'm going to get into that slide. When you're creating that layer, you can add parameters to this layer where you can specify the weight initialization. If you don't, this COM2D class has a default weight initialization scheme and it will use it. But if you want to change it, you just indicate it when you're defining that layer. Okay, so two rules for weight initialization. Sigmoid 10 h will be Xavier, Xavier will be here. This is, this is sufficient information for you at this level. Now we get to babysitting the training. I mean, I think you're theoretically ready to babysit the training. Yeah, it's called babysitting because although you just set everything up and just press enter and it keeps training, you have the graphs and you keep looking at it. And there are, there are points that you need to just interrupt and maybe change things and start the training uh, again. That's called babysitting the training because it's just like a baby, you're trying to make it grow. Mm, I call the babysitting, the babysitting the training phase, the first phase of training. Because at this stage, we only use the training data. What we do is we pre-process the input data, just like you've seen it. We initialize each layer the weights. Then what we do is, we first check the loss of the first mini batch. It needs to be a reasonable value. Sometimes you'll see that it becomes not a number like infinity. If that loss is infinity, you are doing something wrong with the initialization. Or in other words, you are putting the blind guy to a bad spot. The blind guy will not be able to feel the slope if the loss is not reasonable. You're, you're, you're at a stage where the loss is not reasonable and at that point, the analytical gradient of that loss function will not provide you some important value. You're just far away in the uh, weight initialization valley, weight valley. So when you have a observable proper value for the loss, which means you have put, put the blind guy to a proper place, you continue the backpropagation algorithm. A mini batch forward pass, the backward pass, weights are updated. Another mini batch, <coughs> which means another iteration, forward pass, backward pass, up, update the weights. Another mini batch, another iteration. When all these iterations are ends, and, and the training set is completed, when you've used all the mini batches in the training set, <coughs> it means an epoch is completed. So, for example, <coughs> I'm really sorry. <coughs> you have 1,000 samples in your training set and your mini batch size is 10. For one epoch, you will have 1,000 over 10, 100 iterations, okay? While doing this, while doing this, observe the training loss. Is it decreasing? Because the blind guy should be following a downward path. 
if it is not following the downward path, it's like he's lost because he knows that he should go downward path. Okay? Your the training loss decreasing means you are overfitting the training data. That's the first thing you should do. I mean, that's not the uh, ultimate goal, I know, because if you overfit the training data, it is not good. You won't be getting good results with validation data or test real life data. But at the first step, the first phase of the training, you need to make sure that you can overfit the training data. In other words, blind guy following the downward slope. If the training loss do not fall, check the activations. Because training loss do not fall means blind guy not feeling the slope well. Blind guy not feeling the slope well means the gradients are not back propagated during the back propagation algorithm. So the first thing you should check is, are there dead neurons? Are my activations dead? So what you do is you check it. This is the most important step, guys. If you can come over this first step, you're there, you'll just, it will be more mechanical. You'll just try and try, change the parameters and you'll get better results with validation and better results. But you will most probably hit this wall. You have set everything up and it's not decreasing and the loss values are crazy. This is how you do it. And the last part is very important. If you've hit that wall, you will need to check the gradients, debugging each iteration line by line. Okay, that's the strategy. And after the labs, you're at a point where you know what I'm exactly talking about. Good. Okay. The second phase of training, I call it the validation. I, I don't call it, it is called. It's not something I invented. Because at this point, we are over the first phase where we know that the blind guy is following the downward slope. And we know that if we just follow that downward slope well, we will be overfitting, but we don't want to. So let's check the validation set that we did not use as many batches. We did not use in training. What we can do is, you will optimize your hyperparameters. Okay, you have trained it for, I don't know, 10 epochs. And you check the training loss is somewhere, and you check the validation loss. If the training loss is too low, but the validation loss is high, maybe you're overfitting. Maybe you should change your parameters. Maybe you should check, change your network architecture, that change your learning rate or the decay rate. What is decay rate? I'm going to get there. There's a, something called weight decay in the learning rate. So at the second phase, you observe the training versus validation losses with respect to the epochs. So at each epoch, you check how it's for the training loss is decreasing, but the validation loss is not. You observe this. How you can do this is by checking the training graphs. Training graphs are the graphs where you have the iterations or the epochs at the x-axis and the loss or accuracy in the y-axis. And you have two separate graphs for the training and validation. So as you can see, the training loss decreases as the iterations go. The validation loss is also decreasing as the iterations go. This is not a bad graph. I mean, it's a bad graph I'm going to be talking about because it's underfitting, but still you are past the first stage the training graph is decreasing. I mean, uh, it is working. However, there are things that you need to do. So if you come to the question why this graph is not sufficiently enough for us, is not sufficient for us, because there's a large difference between the validation and the training loss. Training and validation loss is this is a loss graph. You're feeding training values and you're getting results closer to the ground truth. But when you're feeding the validation values and you're not, you, uh, 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 when you're feeding the validation values, you are not getting values closer to the ground truth for those validation values, validation inputs. So why, what, what, what is this phenomenon? This phenomenon is called, when you encounter a graph like this, is called underfitting. Okay, you don't want to overfit, but you don't want to underfit. 
An underfed model can be identified from the learning curve of the training loss only. It may show that flat line. It's not decreasing enough. It is decreasing, but not decreasing enough. This guy not decreasing enough will actually make this guy not decreasing enough as well. Okay, it is like a flat line. I mean, it is decreasing, I see, but we, we're looking for a more exponentially decreasing graph. Okay, it may show a flat line or a noisy values of relatively high loss. Okay, indicating that the model was unable to learn. An example of this is shown in the figure. Okay, if, what, what could be the reason? Well, it is decreasing, but it is not decreasing fast enough. It could be the learning rate. What I would do in such a graph would be first to increase the learning rate, which is the step size of the blind guy. Because it is like, there was the blind guy three hours ago and uh, I, I check him again three hours later and he just walked a little path down. Maybe he's walking too slow. Maybe we should tell him to make larger steps. That's the learning rate. Or if I tried the learning steps and if I still have the problem, it is most probably the model's capacity on complexity, uh, model's capacity is not enough for the complexity of the data set. You're using a simple model for the data set. It is like you are not using LXNet, but you are using a two layered architecture to learn the image net. It cannot learn, okay? This underfitting is usually solved by increasing the capacity of the model. So let's continue understanding the network. So an underfit model may also be identified by the training loss that is decreasing and continues to decrease at the end of the plot. So it is still decreasing. Uh, this indicates that the model is capable of further learning and possible further improvements that the training process was halted prematurely. Maybe you should continue learning because this is, in that case, it wouldn't be underfitting. It would be you cutting the training process early. However, maybe the capacity is not enough so that it cannot come to a point where the learning saturates. The blind guy cannot find a proper spot. It's always going downwards. We want a convex space for the uh, optimization process. These are not the things that you will come across easily, guys. I mean, because you will be selecting the architecture from the literature and uh, most probably the capacity of the architecture will not be uh, lower for you, low for you. It will be high, it can be high, where you experience the overfitting problem, but most probably it will, it will not be low. Let's get to overfitting then. Overfitting refers to a model where the, learn, uh, the model has learned the training set too well that it is doing bad with the validation set. So the problem with overfitting is that uh, the more specialized the model becomes to training data, the less uh, good it becomes with the validation data. And in real life, we have the validation data. So how do we experience this? We usually experience this where at some point in the training graph, validation and training detaches. At some point, validation starts to increase, although training loss continues to decrease. The uh, relation loss starts to increase, although the uh, training loss uh, continues to decrease. So the blind guy still finding a slope down, but that down slope doesn't have the validation loss. So the plot of training loss continues to decrease with experience, the plot of validation loss decreases to a point and begins increasing again. As you can see, validation decreased and at some point it started to increase. This, is, this point is usually called the inflection point. It is the point where actually you should have stopped the training. And the number of epochs you should have stopped the training is actually a hyperparameter. That's why we designate it using a validation set. Okay, I would say that after iteration 150, stop it. I don't know what does it mean. If this is an epoch, I don't know, think it's an epoch, it's an iteration. How many iterations will make one epoch? I don't know, this is a, just an example. So this is a very, I mean, representative graph showing the dynamics of overfitting. We have more complex problems. We may encounter more complex problems when we look at the training graphs. 
One of them is the unrepresentative training set. For example, you're trying to learn something. You're trying to learn, uh, you're trying to detect something, faces. If you do not have enough faces in your training set, it will be difficult for the network to learn. That's called an unrepresentative data set, uh, training set. It means that the training set does not provide sufficient information to learn the problem relative to the validation that the set used to evaluate it. So that if it, can, it cannot learn, it cannot evaluate the validation set. This may occur if the training set has too few examples compared to the validation data set. So there's an unbalance in your sets. This is similar to overfitting because when you do not have a representative data for the problem, your model will not care. It's going to learn that training set anyway, but it will be learning something else, not your problem. And if the training set does not represent the problem, the results that you will get from the validation set will be different. And that will affect, create a result like overfitting. So an unrepresentative training set will be more oscillate, oscillatory. However, in the end, you will see that gap between the validation and the training set. So keep that in mind. Is my training set represented in one? An unrepresentative validation set is another story. You have a representative training set, okay. You, you see the blue graph, which is the training set. It trains and just decreases and it saturates at some point. The blind guy somehow found a way, good. But when you look at the validation loss, it is oscillating. Most probably you don't have proper examples in the validation set to test. Not enough examples, not proper examples. Well, in this case, you will need to construct the validation set once again, because you are using the validation set to find the inflection point where you should end the training. Without a proper validation set, you won't be able to set that hyperparameter properly. Okay. So babysitting is actually reading these graphs in your projects. That's one of the main purposes, how you read that graph and how you corrected your network, because it's not going to work. Oh, that's important guys. For people outside of deep learning world, training could be a black box, like something off the shelf. Okay, there's data, there's the outputs, get that model, train it, make it work. It could look like this to them, not for you. You are the guys who are going to make it work. That's why the first thing you should get from this course, an introductory level deep learning course, is to learn how to babysit your models. And Sometimes you will experience problems, so you will need to learn how to manipulate those problems to make the training go smooth, just like it needs to. Okay, another example of unrepresentative validation sets. Uh, so again, we have an unrepresentative validation set where the validation loss is too low. In this example, what I would say is, okay, the training is good, but validation ha set has two perfect examples, the loss is always good. Well, then the validation set is not the real world, but the validation set has to represent the real world. Otherwise, it's not a validation set. Hence, the validation set is somewhat unrepresentative if you come across a graph like this. Okay, a good fit. It's, it's like a perfect fit, but for simple problems, you're going to encounter this. So they just, validation and training set are designed evenly. They are similar, but they do not include the same examples. And when you train them, they saturate together. And what I would do is I would take this point like an inflection point because after that point, the training loss does not decrease much. So after the, if this is the epoch number, after epoch 17, for example, I would stop the training and use that model. So a plot of learning curves shows a good fit if the plot of training loss decreases to a point of stability, the plot of validation loss decreases to a point of stability, which is similar to the point of stability of the training loss, and which, in other words, has a small gap with the training loss. Good. So those will be in the next hour. Any questions before we do a break? Any questions?